Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today's guest is Hannah, and I'm excited to talk to her about the gut. Many um, guests have been on the show and have talked about the gut related to your mood or related to different um, specific things, but we just never talk about the gut in general. And I know a lot of people deal with digestive issues and being bloated or hurting after they eat. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. But before we begin, will you just tell my audience a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got involved in what you do now? Absolutely. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm Hannah Aylward. I'm the CEO and founder of HAN. And at HAN, we really help women overcome chronic digestive issues that we've been struggling with for typically years and years. And I really got into this work because I needed it myself. So I struggled with my own digestive issues for years and years. And I, I feel like that's why a lot of us get into this work. <laughs> We're trying to find a solution to our, to our own problems. Um, I was someone that I was eating really healthy. I exercised consistently. I was young and I just still felt awful. Like I would look six months pregnant after eating an apple. I would, you know, I tried going, eating an only raw diet. I tried eating oil free. I tried eating low FODMAP. I tried every single diet in the book. Um, And nothing was really getting to the bottom of these chronic digestive issues. I would eliminate um, gluten and dairy. And Those things helped a little bit, but I was still like, something is off, like for how healthy I eat, for how active I am, like something is really missing here. It caused me so much stress and pain when traveling, um, when going out to eat. I mean, I would always pack my own snacks. Like I was terrified to go out and get dinner with my girlfriends, you know, and this is what we see in a lot of our clients as well. So things just weren't really making sense. (laughs) You know, I was having all of these issues and I was still feeling really bad and I was kind of learning about functional medicine and learning about these more holistic kind of root cause approaches. And so much of it really revolved around just peeling out all of these foods, but I was trying that and nothing was really helping a hundred percent. Right. So that's when I really decided to dig a lot deeper and dive into the research about the gut microbiome and really start to learn from all of these experts in the field. And I saw some commonalities. I was realizing that regardless of what they were helping people with, whether it was like thyroid conditions or skin health or digestive issues or energy, everyone was addressing the gut. So that's when I kind of became obsessed and realized how just how important it was um, and kind of started developing my method that we use with clients now to really help them, you know, really dig deep and uncover the root causes of these digestive issues and start to feel better, really like get their lives back and not feel like they're just at constant war with their own bodies. So interesting. As you're explaining your health issues, I think a lot of women can relate to you because I Um, get told on DMs all the time, like I hurt after I eat or people Mm -hmm. will commonly say like, yeah, I look like six months pregnant after I eat something nutritious. I don't know what's going on. So I'm really excited to dive into this with you and talk about this. So let's just first start with being bloated because I know that's a one that's very common for people. And so why are so many people being bloated or hurt after they eat? Yes. Bloating is like the number one complaint (laughs) our clients come to us with. IBS, bloating, food sensitivities and reactions. Those are kind of like some of the top things. Bloating is really just essentially a buildup of gas in the intestines. And it can feel a little tricky because there's actually many different underlying root causes of bloating. So not everyone's case is exactly the same, right? We can get, um, we can experience bloating if we have gut bacterial dysbiosis. We've got an imbalance of our gut microbes causing some of this bloating. We can experience bloating if we have low stomach acid production, if we aren't producing adequate pancreatic enzymes. These are like some of our digestive juices that we need to break down our food efficiently and then assimilate the nutrients from our food efficiently. So any breakdown kind of in the digestive process can contribute to that bloating. Um, Things like increased intestinal permeability can contribute to bloating as well. So it's really, um, I think people can get very overwhelmed by all of the information out there and all of like the tips and the Instagram posts and everything, because a lot of it is very specific to what's going on in your body. And that's where I get really lit up about the work because we can take someone's health journey of like kind of 
throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something works, you know, hoping it sticks Mm. and go, no, this is really what you need right now. And your cause of bloating may be different than someone else's cause of bloating. You know, someone could have a fungal overgrowth that's causing the bloating and someone could have low pancreatic enzyme secretion and that's causing their bloating. Usually we're looking at like a few, a few underlying causes um, per case, but yeah, there's so many different, different causes of bloating. And um, the biggest way to really know the difference for anyone that's kind of wondering is like bloating feels like that painful belly distension, right? It almost feels like you could stick a needle in your tummy and it would just pop or deflate. Um, It's not pleasant. I was chronically bloated for so long and I would just pray that I would like be able to go out and just button my high-waisted black jeans so I could go out to dinner with my friends when I was, you know, a couple of years ago before I really dug into my own gut health. Um, So it's a different feeling than like, oh, I I ate a little too much or like, oh, I have some abdominal fat that's like soft and cushy. It's a, it's more of a painful feeling. Okay. So I know, like I said, I have listeners who deal with this and now you've just said, well, it depends on their root cause. So Mm -hmm. are there things that they can do? to help with the bloatedness, like take digestive enzymes or some, you know, something for the stomach acid, or do they need to just start with seeing some type of doctor to figure out why they're bloated? Great question. So there's a lot of kind of hacks and things you can try at home on your own. You know, typically when we see a client, by the time they get to us, they've already altered the diet. They've already probably seen, I mean, on average, like four gastroenterologists, they've, they've tried a lot of things, right? They're not eating fried foods anymore, processed foods, whatever it is. So it's kind of that like next level case, as opposed to someone that is, you know, a little bloated after a few slices of pizza. Like I would put these people in different categories, right? If you feel like you're someone who you're eating quote unquote clean, you're like eating veggies, you're eating proteins, you're eating fruits and you know, all of that, like nuts and seeds. And, um, you've taken out gluten, you've taken out dairy and you're still feeling bloated after everything you eat, or maybe you wake up feeling bloated before you've even eaten anything, or your bloating gets progressively worse and worse as the day goes on. These are kind of all signs that like, it might be time to dig a little a little deeper. Um, but with that being said, I mean, first kind of line of intervention is nutrition adjustments, right? Are you eating whole foods? Are you eating healthy foods? Can we support your gut microbiome, which is that, you know, um, environment of microorganisms within the gut? Can we support that through food? See how that goes. If that goes well, great. If that doesn't go so well, sometimes people feel like <laughs> they eat healthier, they feel worse, <laughs> um, that we see that too. Then it's kind of like, okay, what's the next, what's the next stage of intervention? So um, testing comes into play here. Like we run functional stool testing with all of our clients. But if you're not ready for all of that yet, you can try some at-home things like chewing your food really well before you swallow it because you know, mastication, this is like one of the first stages of digestion. And I always say we don't have teeth anywhere else in the GI tract. (laughs) So after you swallow that food, you're purely relying on your own digestive juices to break down that food. And if you're low in digestive juices, which is very common for people that are stressed and running around all the time, you're not, you know, you're already kind of setting yourself up for bloating, maldigestion. So, um, chewing your food really well, Taking a few deep breaths before you eat can help really support your nervous system and calm the nervous system, which will then help you digest your food better. Um, And then, you know, things like digestive enzymes. I would say digestive enzymes overall, what they are, like our body produces enzymes to help break down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, So they're essentially just helping us break down our food well. You can try them. I think they can be really supportive for some people. Um, They're not going to be like a savior for everyone, you know, but it doesn't, in my opinion, it's not really like going to do any harm. So you can give it a, give it a shot. Well, and I know as we age, we lose some of those enzymes as well. So I know for older people, the digestive enzymes might be a, you know, necessary thing that they need, but you mentioned, you mentioned stress. And I want to talk about that because There are so many people. I read a report the other day that 62 million people are dealing with digestive issues, but those are only those that have actually gone to a doctor about their problems, you know? And so that's millions of people dealing with this. And so do you think it's due to stress? Is that one of the main causes of all of, all of these gut issues? It's a big question. And I get asked this a lot and we see mostly women. We help men as well, but I always get questions after I put up all my, all my students' names, people will be like, it's all women. Like, 
what's what's the correlation there, right? And I could get really into that. I think it would take up the entire episode of my my theories, but overall, I think we're we're more stressed than ever and uh, we're more nutrient depleted than ever and we are constantly exposed to these different toxins, whether they're environmental, you know, they're in our food, um whatever it might be. So, it's and and the soil our soil is depleted of nutrients. Like we're we're kind of coming up against a lot of um things that you could just say are stressors, right? Toxins are stressors. Um, but I would also say, you know, you're, you're right on the money. It's like, we are, we live in this hyper connected world where we're always available. We're always just a text away. We're on our phones. We're on our phones while we're watching TV, while we've got our laptop open. I mean, there's no shutting off. So when we work with clients, I will literally tell them like part of your homework is to go, you need to go stare at the wall. I'm like, no phone, no computer, no nothing, no music, no, no, no podcast on like no intaking of new information, right? Go and just sit in silence and ask yourself, when was the last time you actually did that? I mean, when was the last time you really gave yourself space to just be? And most people can't even recall, you know, we're always doing something, go, go, go. And now it's also kind of like, especially for women, you can do it all and have it all, which I am totally here for. I mean, obviously I run a business and, you know, I'm here to empower every woman um, on the planet, truly. And at the same time, it's like, you can't really do it all, all the time, you know, or else things will start to fall apart. So there's a lot there. Well, in the stress, it, I mean, there are some scientific things that it does, right? Like it decreases that stomach acid, like you said, it also What happens with the digestion and stress? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when we are in that that stress response, that sympathetic dominant response from the nervous system, we're in that um, kind of like fight, flight, freeze response. That's going to be that's going to be the opposite response that, that we want when we're looking to digest our food. So we've got the the fight or flight response and we've got our rest and digest response. And I mean, it literally is called rest and digest. So this is the parasympathetic response from the nervous system that we need to be in in order to optimally digest our food. Most of us are not there <laughs> on, a, on a regular basis, right? Um, and when we aren't in that response, when we're in that sympathetic dominant response, blood flow goes away from the GI organs. So digestion is really an afterthought because it's not deemed necessary for survival in that moment. We want to be able to run away from the tiger. So that's automatically kind of reducing our digestive capacity. Then exactly as you said, stomach acid production will decrease. The stress hormone cortisol will go up. Cortisol is going to wear away at that mucosal layer of the gut lining. It can poke holes in the gut lining. It will influence gut motility. Um, It's also going to suppress gut immunity. This is really important for fighting off infections and imbalances and things like that. So it's it's like there's endless direct correlations between stress and gut health. And this is why I speak out a lot about how stress doesn't stay stress because a lot of our clients will come to us after they've seen other practitioners and maybe we're told you're just anxious. It's just your anxiety or it's just your stress. And while stress absolutely plays a role, it doesn't stay stress, right? So the physiological impacts become gut issues. They become gut dysbiosis. Mm. It becomes leaky gut. It becomes suppressed intestinal immunity. Um, and that's also has to be addressed in order to get you feeling better. So there, you know, the gut and the brain are intricately connected. You can't have gut health without brain health. You can't have brain health without gut health. So when we're working with clients, we have to take a really like holistic, thorough approach to getting them better. We've got to look at the nervous system and stress levels. And then we've got to look at essentially what those stress levels caused, right? Which could now be SIBO. It could now be um, low secretory IgA and, and things like that. So interesting that you touched upon the gut brain connection, because just yesterday I was talking to someone who battles depression, but yet he was talking to me about everything that he eats and there was no correlation. And I was trying to teach that there was a correlation and he would not accept it. And so let's just talk about this. How does the gut affect our mental health? Yeah, absolutely. So many ways. So, I mean, like I said, the brain is influencing the gut and the gut is influencing the brain. Like, constantly. And you can kind of sense that the example that I like to give is the feeling of butterflies in your tummy. So you're literally sensing something and you can feel it in your stomach. You didn't eat anything. You didn't take a supplement, right? But you can really feel it here and you may have to run to the bathroom. That's really showing us that gut brain connection. Um, but certain gut bacteria 
uh, produce like neurotransmitters like serotonin, like GABA. These are like feel good neurotransmitters. They help us um, feel safe in our bodies. They help us feel happy. They influence our mood, right? So some of these gut bacteria are influencing these levels of neurotransmitters that can then be linked to different mood disorders. Um, And then there's been some interesting research as well that's shown like different overgrowths and undergrowths of specific gut bacteria um, kind of contributing to cases of depression or how can I rephrase that? Like seen in clients or, or people with depression. So we'll see overgrowths of certain unsupportive bacteria in people that have depression and we'll see undergrowths of the good guys in people that have um, depression as well. Some of these more like short chain fatty acid producers. Um, so there's so much that can be done. And it's kind of, there's many different facets through which our gut is influencing our brain. Yeah. It's amazing to me that people still don't know the connection or see the connection when we have so much research on it. Yeah. And so back to sort of the stress thing, we know food affects the gut and the microbiome and the good bacteria or the bad bacteria, but stress then that can also play a part in what bacteria is growing in your gut also, correct? Yeah. And think about just digestion as a whole. So what I like to educate on digestion, thinking of like north to south. So when we're looking at someone's gut function or digestive issues, we we have to take a look like all the way, right? Every process, what happens starting in the brain, chewing the food after we swallow the food, stomach acid production, and kind of go down the chain there. So there's like many different kind of pieces of the process. So if we are having producing low stomach acid, we're going to end up with maldigestion. That's going to then contribute to that more dysbiotic state, right? Because we're going to have overgrowths that we don't want in there so much. Sometimes low stomach acid can also lead to things like SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, because we're getting that overgrowth in the small intestine where a lot of those bacteria should be in the large intestine. So we can see how if we're under that stress and we're in, the, in that stressed out state, we're going to underproduce stomach acid. That's going to then lead to things like dysbiosis or SIBO that's then going to contribute to increased intestinal permeability. And then we end up with IBS, food sensitivities, lots of bloating, et cetera. So it's, um, you know, there's so many, once again, like different mechanisms through which stress quite literally can damage our, the gut and um, cause hormonal imbalances and things like that. So interesting. Okay. So if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, maybe the gut is part of my mental health issues. We know that um, depression and anxiety, they all have lots of different root causes. So yeah. it, I can't just come on here and say, oh, it is your gut. We know mm-hmm. trauma and past trauma and you know a whole wide variety of things can contribute to depression. But if someone's listening to this, what do you suggest to them to support their gut? So much. <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, Right. Yes, I could go on and on. So really the first thing I would start with is is food, making proper food adjustments, right? Taking a look at the diet. It's where a lot of people start and that's for a good reason. I mean, the food that you eat is going to pretty much immediately impact your gut microbiome. So it's it's incredible what we can do through the power of nutrition. So eliminating more inflammatory foods, um, decreasing, you know, processed sugars, decreasing ultra processed foods overall, fried foods, things like that. Um, Those can all help to support our gut health. And then what I I like to really focus on instead of honestly pulling away like loads and loads of foods. I like to go, can we make sure you're getting in enough of the good stuff? That's what I want you to prioritize because it's really easy to get into this like very restrictive dieting where we're terrified to like have a piece of bread. And I don't want that <laughs> for, for anyone. Um, unless you have celiac disease, it's a little bit of a different conversation, but you know, it's, I just think the functional space can go, can go really restrictive really quick. So I like to really focus on can we make sure you're getting enough of the good stuff? So can we make sure that you're adding in enough polyphenols? Polyphenols are so wonderful for the, for the gut. They support the production of short chain fatty acids that help to support a healthy gut lining, build the mucosal layer of the gut lining. Um, it, they're anti-inflammatory and we can do, we can, you know, our, our gut is like regenerating all the time and we can essentially support it in doing that through eating some of these really delicious, healthy foods. So polyphenol rich foods are, an incredible add-in. And it's as simple as like 
buying organic mixed berries. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't need to be super duper complicated, but making sure that you're getting those in on a regular basis. And um, an easy way to kind of remember polyphenols is think of foods that stain. Think of foods that like you put them on your cutting board and they're going to like leave a mark like turmeric or like beets. Like they're kind of, it's kind of a mess, <laughs> but they're so deeply, richly colored. Those foods are going to be loaded with polyphenols and your gut loves those. So make sure you're getting in enough of those. And then also prebiotics. There's so much conversation about probiotics in this space. And while they can be totally helpful, they absolutely have their place. Um, we use them with clients, all of that good stuff. We need prebiotics to actually feed these good gut bacteria. So we want to make sure we're getting in enough um, good prebiotics through the foods that we're eating and then just widening diversity. So a, a nice, robust, resilient, healthy gut microbiome can tolerate most foods. And you'll, I say that over and over and over again, because we'll see people coming in eating the same five foods because they're scared. They're scared to eat the other foods. And I get that. I've personally been there. Um, but just know that a, a, you know, a healthy gut can tolerate pretty much, pretty much all foods like with, with a handful here and there, you know, that don't work so well with you. Um, so we want to increase the diversity of these plant fibers of these good, healthy whole foods in our diet as much as we can to help support and, and build a nice, resilient gut microbiome. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that about people that come with you to, you know, with like five foods that they can't eat. And so if that's the case, if people think like, oh, I only can eat these 10 foods, you know, I hear that quite often. Mm -hmm. Really, their gut just needs some healing, some support, some work, right? So that they can reintroduce those other foods. Oh yeah. This is like my, one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the job <laughs> is when people come in, <laughs> it, it, I'm thinking of, um, a client we had more recently. So she came in, she could only eat two vegetables. She could only tolerate two vegetables. Oh, wow. And by the time I know that's pretty bad, we'll see some pretty intense cases. And then by the time she left, she could eat, you know, 10, 15 different vegetables and that will get better and better over time too, because your gut's like a muscle. So when we start to add in these little fibers, when we clean up the gut, and then we start to add in little bits of these fibers, your gut starts to rebuild these good populations of supportive bacteria. So for example, I couldn't eat anything. I mean, I would react to all kinds of foods. I had loads of food intolerances, what someone may call sensitivities. Um, I would react, I mean, to healthy foods, apples, sweet potatoes. Like I didn't know what to eat anymore. Honestly, I felt like bloated after drinking water at some points. And now I can eat essentially whatever I want. I mean, I can pretty much go out for a burger and fries and feel fine afterwards, which I never thought that would ever, ever, ever be possible for me. Cause I was kind of the girl that like really had to watch what she ate. It wasn't as easy for me. I was convinced that's just how I was. I was convinced I was broken. Um, you know, we can really get into everything that comes with these digestive issues, but basically after really working on repairing my gut function, my ability to digest food and cleaning up my gut microbiome, I'm now able to tolerate, you know, so many more foods. And I use my own example because, because it's mine, but we see it in clients like, like, day, day in and day out, really. People that come in can't eat dairy. They leave, they can enjoy ice cream. They come in, they can't eat onions. They leave, they cooked a soup with a full onion. I mean, and that's when I'm just like, yay. <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't yeah, like, that's you know, people needing all that restriction. Okay. So I'm sure people are listening like, yeah, but that takes years. I don't have years to do this, or I don't want to spend the years to do this. Is it a long lengthy process? Does it take a lot of hard work? Like what does this entail? Yes. Um, it'll take a little time, you know, it will. So to set proper expectations, like it's very dependent on what you've got going on, your history, how long you've been struggling, all of that. Right. So we'll see people that have been struggling for 15 years. We'll see some people that have had some issues for two years. These people are probably going to respond a little differently. Right. Then we've got like genetic factors, detoxification things, all of that stuff. Um, but in general, like I like to put in four to like eight months of good work to, to work on the gut. Um, so like all of the programs that we work with clients through start at four months. Cause that's kind of like the minimum. It's not a week thing. Um, it's not a 30 day thing. It's going to take a bit, a bit of work, but truly like 
it's very worth it. I mean, I got, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say I got my, my life back on the other side of it because it was so hindered by all of these issues. I think back and I'm like the things I could have accomplished if I wasn't constantly worried about my stomach and what I was going to eat and how I was going to react. I mean, it's, it's wild, right? So, um, it will take time. I like to be very upfront about that and, um, it'll be work. Absolutely. It's going to be work because if you have these habits kind of ingrained, anytime we go to change a habit, anytime we go to do something new, the brain's going to go, no, that's scary. We don't want to do that. So we're going to have some resistance. We're going to have to feel some discomfort. Um, but once again, like the transformation on the other side is absolutely worth it in, in my opinion. Um, and what's really cool too, is the gut is at the center of so much. So we'll see digestive issues fall away, of course, but we'll also see skin clear. We'll see energy get better. We'll see brain fog go away. We'll see sleep get better. So it's like, um, people will get pregnant. You know, I mean, I just had someone in, in my last round, she had been trying for three years unsuccessfully and she didn't even make it through the entire program and she got pregnant. So it's like, it's worth it (laughs) in my, in my, in my humble opinion, it's worth it. It's so worth it. But also, I mean, I hear that a lot too, that they end up getting pregnant because almost all the hormones come in contact with some, or with the gut at some point, whether to be like secreted by it or regulated by the Mm -hmm. gut or created by the gut. And so is that why you think she probably got pregnant? Just cleaning up the gut helped with the her- hormonal balance? Cleaning up the gut, absolutely. And um, so, you know, to get kind of technical, phase three of estrogen detoxification happens in the gut. So, you know, our liver processes and detoxifies estrogen mainly. And then we have something called the estrobilome, which is like the word estrogen and microbiome put together that helps to regulate these levels of circulating, recirculating estrogens within the body. So, um, when we go to kind of clean up this, any gut dysbiosis and also support liver detoxification, because we're absolutely going to do that. It plays a, a key role in all of this. We're going to kind of help quote unquote, rebalance hormones, hormones, like hormone balance is kind of a term. It, it, it's not fully, it's not fully true, you know, but they're always in fluctuation. We want them in like a, in a nice dance, I would say. Um, but essentially if someone's having these more estrogen dominant symptoms, we, we've got to take a look at the gut. And that's what, that's what we do by really cleaning, cleaning everything up there and then supporting liberty detoxification. What we're also really doing is helping our clients' bodies feel safe. So if your body does not feel safe, you cannot repair. And if your body doesn't feel safe, you won't ovulate. And if you're not ovulating, you won't produce adequate progesterone. And this is where we'll see this more estrogen dominant state in so many women because they're not, they're under eating, they're over exercising, they have, they're under tons of stress. And then they also have this big stressor that is inflammation in the gut with all of these deeper gut issues. Like that's its own stressor, you know? So when we work to kind of help the body feel safe, add in nutrients, add in minerals, balance blood sugar, you know, clean up the gut. We're, we're hitting it at so many angles. And that's why I believe that happened. (laughs) So interesting. Okay. So you touched upon liver detoxification. That's sort of a trendy thing that you hear quite often about, Mm. um, on social media these days and people talking about the liver being overburdened and things like that. And so really what does this mean, but also how can people help support their liver, um, detox better? Yeah. So, you know, the liver and gallbladder, I consider digestive organs. Um, the liver really helps. It, it helps us produce bile. It produces bile. And then the gallbladder essentially stores it and pushes it out at mealtimes. And this is essential because this helps us break down fats. And it also helps us assimilate our fat soluble nutrients like vitamins A, D, E, and K. So we need our liver working properly. Of course, it also helps us detoxify overall. It helps us, you know, get rid of excess estrogens, myco toxins, like toxins from mold and things like that. And we are, I mean, we're pretty much bombarded with toxins all the time. So I get a little like, eh, when people are like, but your liver's always detoxing. I'm like, yeah, it is. And we're also constantly bombarded with toxins, you know? So that, that doesn't mean your body isn't like working for you. Your body's always working for you, but we can also give it a little support there, you know? And then people are drinking alcohol, people are taking medications. I mean, we're just stacking toxins on toxins, most of us. So 
a little gentle support, I don't think it's going to do anyone any harm. And it will. I mean, if we have that liver stagnation and we've got gallbladder issues, bile flow issues, that can be a huge underlying root cause of bloating. It, it's a huge underlying root cause of hormonal imbalances as well. So, um, you know, some gentle things to kind of support that detoxification are eating adequate protein. So we need amino acids to support um, some of the stages of liver detoxification. So we want to make sure we're eating adequate protein. And then one of the biggest recommendations I would say we give is getting in bitter foods. So these bitter herbs and bitter foods help to stimulate bile. Um, They help to get your digestive juices going essentially. So that would be things like arugula and um, lemon and digestive bitters. I love digestive bitters, like arguably more than an enzyme, Um, depending on the person, depending on their need really, but love digestive bitters, very gentle. So things that contain like dandelion and artichoke, um, these are all a great way to help your body start to produce those digestive juices um, on its own. And that's going to then help kind of, you know, move the the liver and the gallbladder in the right direction. Okay. So, I mean, this is a very technical question, but what (laughs) happens if someone doesn't have a gallbladder? Yeah, we see it a lot. I, I I was just talking about this yesterday. So we see it all the time. Um, This is, this is like, I need to write a book on it. (laughs) Because I get the question all the time. So, you know, I have a little bit of beef with like removing an organ being the first line of defense, like the first intervention. It's like, let's just take out the organ, you know? I'm like, ah, please don't. Of course, sometimes, I mean, it it will literally save your life. So I'm not trying to invalidate it at all. Um, Right. with, With that being said, it's there's so many, there's so much else that we can do. So the gallbladder pushes bile out at meal times to help us break down fats. Bile is also antimicrobial in nature, which is really important because it helps to kind of keep the small intestine sterilized. Um, It's not entirely sterile, but it helps kind of keep things in check for lack of lack of better phrasing. So we will run into issues there if we remove the gallbladder. We essentially aren't able to push out enough bile at meal times. It's kind of more of like a slow drip. So if you have had your gallbladder removed, like you'll need bile support going forward. Um, And I'm sorry if no one told you that. (laughs) And it can also lead to things like SIBO. It can lead to, you know, more like estrogen dominant symptoms and things like that. And the biggest issue that I have with it is that if you just remove the organ, we're not addressing why you needed to remove the organ in the first place, which is probably a liver issue that's been developing over time. It's kind of like um, going on birth control for um, really painful PMS or skin. Like say you say you were put on birth control for acne the lack of birth control is obviously not causing the acne, right? So once you get off of birth control, then then what? All of this stuff's just essentially been brewing. So that's my biggest my biggest um, kind of pain with it is like either way, we need to support your liver, um, whether you still have your gallbladder or not. And then if it's been removed, you know, you'll have some fat, fat mild digestion, which you can probably feel. You'll probably feel heavier after you eat fats. You might have like floating stools um, and things like that, you know, so some support there will go a long way. Okay, good for the listeners to hear about the bile <laughs> support. So with supporting the liver, do you like glutathione? Yeah, yeah. Do you like supplementing with that? Yeah, I think glutathione, you know, it's kind of like the liver's like master antioxidant. Um, we'll use it. it. It has been shown to support a healthy gut lining as well. Um, not everyone responds to it super well, like especially initially, but I think it, it can be a great add-in for many, Yeah. Okay. I do love glutathione for those that need additional liver support. So I think it's a great supplement. Okay. So I have a question for you. Something else that's sort of trendy on social media is balancing blood sugar, Mm -hmm. but how does balancing blood sugar play a role in supporting the gut or does it, or does it not? Yeah, absolutely. You know, People, nutritionists around the world have been teaching people to balance their blood sugar for a long time (laughs) before it popped off on social. it's just now trendy. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And it'll fade and it'll come back in like five years. Um, But it's really at the core of of everything. I mean, it's like nutrition 101. Learn to balance your blood sugar through the food that you're eating. There's other lifestyle things that we can do as well. Um, But... 
to to put it very simply, erratic blood sugar levels, like ups and downs, it's it's very inflammatory for the body. It, it's a stressor for the body. So if you think about it, like, um, and this is big for anyone that's feeling burnt out, anyone that's chronically exhausted, any anyone listening who's like, I'm really, I've been burning the candle at both ends, right? Or you feel like you're running on stress hormones, like it's like hard to relax. You can't meditate. You're always worried. You're kind of jumpy. Um, I get this. <laughs> I, I resonate with this well. Um, it's very easy to run on stress hormones hormones, but, and a lot of us are very used to it, but the, this is, you know, when we're running on these stress hormones, that's obviously not super supportive for our overall health. And in order to kind of get off that hamster wheel, we've got to learn to balance our blood sugar because when our blood sugar goes up really high, it's going to drop really low. And when it drops really low, the body's going to push out cortisol to help to raise those blood glucose levels because it's dangerous when it drops really low. Right. Um, so we can't get off that kind of hamster wheel of like running on this stress response. If we're not working to regulate our blood sugar levels. Now we know how, you know, I've already talked about how cortisol Dam, you know, damages our gut function and our gut health overall. So these are all really connected. And then we'll see as well that over time, you know, these blood sugar kind of ups and downs can damage gut motility, um, which is really just like the movement uh, of food through the GI tract. So we don't want it to be too fast. We don't want it to be too slow. Um, we want it to kind of be just right. So we'll see that erratic blood sugar levels are also going to kind of damage nerve function and then damage gut motility, um, which we don't want either. But kind of just to like widen the lens. I mean, balancing your blood sugar is one of the, I wouldn't say it's easy for everyone, but it's the concepts of it are simple. And it's one of the most um, life-changing things that you could do. So if you take something away from this, from this podcast, go learn how to balance your blood sugar through the food that you're eating. Um, because you really, you really should feel the difference pretty quickly. Okay. So good to know. But I'm curious, um, does the gut microbiome influence blood sugar levels at all or not necessarily? So we have seen some research where certain gut bacteria can influence insulin um, sensitivity. Um, and then there is a keystone strain of gut bacteria as well that's called Acromantia mucinophilia. Um, and that has been shown to have an interesting kind of correlation with like metabolic function, um, our mucosal layer of the gut lining, but also potentially insulin insulin sensitivity as well. So I do think that the the connection is bidirectional there too. What's interesting to me is that there's a connection of the foods that are going to spike your blood sugar are also the foods that usually aren't good for your gut in the mm -hmm. first place, mm -hmm. right? So the sugar, the high fructose corn syrup, things like that, correct? Yeah. And, and I'd say ultra processed carbohydrates too. So like, you know, um, donuts and cakes and things like that, that of course have the sugar as well, but more of those like, yeah, really starchy, ultra processed carbohydrates. Um, those are going to really spike blood sugar as well. So yeah, exactly. I mean, there's lots of benefits to minimizing those foods and adding in more whole foods, good quality proteins, veggies, things like that. Okay. So you talked about, um, these spikes and drops with our blood glucose levels causing inflammation, being a stressor. So they're causing inflammation in the gut. So are there, is this inflammation in the gut also contributing to the insulin resistance or the, the elevated blood sugar levels or not necessarily? Um, well, I would say in general, when there's an imbalance in the gut bacteria, that can influence our insulin sensitivity, which is essentially like how well we can kind of regulate these blood sugar levels, right? But the other thing to really note is that what happens in the gut doesn't really stay in the gut because the majority of our immune system is in the gut. So that's where we'll see a lot of gut issues come out in different ways, right? It's not just that it's like a digestive issue. It turns into a skin issue. It turns into um, headaches, joint pain, right? Autoimmune conditions and things like that. So it's like, we want to take a look at how and, and really notice how these issues in the gut can actually cause all of these other symptoms. Um, and the immune system is essentially kind of you know, when there's an issue in the gut, when there's like increased intestinal permeability or something like that, it's kind of alerting that immune system. And the immune system response is letting all different parts of the body know that something's going on. So we'll see many different symptoms kind of come back to the health of the gut. So it's really like, there's no, um, I like to say taking care of your gut health is a root cause approach kind of in and of itself, you know, it's because of how deeply it's connected to really everything. Okay. 
Um, so I want to ask you a few other questions. You touched upon way earlier about like candida or SIBO or other things going on in the gut. And so, and you were talking about that maybe that's part of the reason of so many people having digestive issues, things like that. And so is there a way for someone to know without testing like, oh, I may have SIBO or these are things that are like, oh, I may have candida because of these symptoms or are these things they need to just go get test and be diagnosed with? Yeah, great question. So a lot of these symptoms overlap a lot. So I am a big fan of testing because I can take an educated guess after speaking to someone because I've worked with so many people, but so many of these symptoms really overlap and the underlying causes and the, the symptoms overlap, right? So candida can cause bloating, SIBO will cause bloating, dysbiosis will cause bloating, low stomach acid will cause bloating. So the testing is really helpful there. Um, so you're not just guessing. And I, and I stress this because I should have done this earlier <laughs> on my personal journey. I would have saved myself a lot of time and pain had I just like and really knew that this even existed, the right testing and all of that good stuff. Um, but I mean, common signs and symptoms of some of these things I can run through if that's helpful for people. So you could even go like, oh, maybe it's worth getting tested. Um, SIBO, you know, we'll see lots of big chronic bloating. That's very common to have that six months pregnant belly bloat look. Um, it's very common to feel bloated after more fibrous foods, after foods higher in FODMAPs, which are essentially like um, a form of digestible carbohydrate that is actually it's actually good for our gut bugs, but when we have an overgrowth, that's when we react. So if you feel like you're really sensitive to like garlic and onions um, and broccoli and you get really, really bad bloating after eating those things, that could be a sign. Um, usually we'll see bloating happen like an hour and a half to two hours kind of after eating with SIBO as well. Um, it's kind of, we'll see skin issues come up with it too. So those are some of like the biggest cause or symptoms that you can go, Hmm, I have a lot of those. Maybe that's, maybe that's worth getting tested. And then for candida bloating, um, well, you can see like chronic uh, recurring yeast infections. Um, I, we see lots of skin issues with candida. So we'll, we'll have people come in with like bad acne or eczema. Um, there's almost always candida. <laughs> so candida is like a big, there's a big correlation with skin there. Um, you'll also have like a lot of kind of honestly, maybe even uncontrollable sugar cravings. We'll see that pretty commonly and bad brain fog as well. So those are some of the big things that we see with candida. And I see a lot of food reactions that are kind of like all over the map, like random foods. Like I can't tolerate mango. I can't tolerate this sauce or whatever, as opposed to like thought maps. Um, so those mm. are kind of some of the symptoms of candida. We'll see it with both constipation and diarrhea, honestly. So this is also once again, why the testing is helpful. Um, and then gut dysbiosis. I mean, everything. <laughs> gut dysbiosis is linked to like, I want to say 90% of different uh, chronic diseases. So it's like so many symptoms, but pretty commonly you feel like you eat a meal on one day and you're fine. And then you eat the exact same meal the next day and you have a flare up and you react differently to it. We hear that all the time in clients um, or feeling like you're eating these healthy foods and you are really bloated and you have all of these digestive issues. And then of course you're reacting to like lots of different foods. Like you feel like your, your list of food and uh, sensitivities and intolerances is like off the charts. Um, we'll see that a lot. And then of course there's like constipation, bloating. Um, if you've been diagnosed with IBS, like we can dig deeper and find what it, what's really going on there. Well, those are really good to know. I know I've had many listeners who will be like, oh my gosh, I just crave sugar like crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, I want it after every time I eat things like that, or I don't have the willpower to stop it. And I'm like, well, sometimes it could easily be candida or mm -hmm. you're low in magnesium or something like that. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a big one of candida. And so if people just listening to you heard all those symptoms, can they just go to a general practitioner doctor and get this tested or they have to come see someone like you or do they go to a holistic doctor? Where can they find good testing for these? Yeah. So I would say in general, like a traditional Western medical doc probably is not running like functional stool testing. Um, it, you want to look for more of like a functional medicine doctor, um, a naturopath or, you know, come see us. I've got a team of functional registered dietitians. So we run these labs. We run functional stool testing on every client that works with us. And that's how we really like help, help people not just manage these symptoms, but really get rid of a lot of these symptoms. And that's, that's what I feel very passionately about as well. So, um, um, yeah, the more functional labs, I'd say typically aren't found at 
just like a, a Western medical, what Western medicine doctor, um, but more of that functional approach, that root cause approach, that type of practitioner, um, hopefully, hopefully can help you and, and really find someone that specializes in it because there's also a lot of people running these tests that don't, don't see it a lot or they don't specialize in what you've got going on. So I would really like do, do your research and look into, have they helped someone like me before? Um, do they specialize in this? Like we see chronic GI cases every day. That's like our bread, our bread and butter, you know? So, um, find someone, whether it's us or someone else that's really seen, a, seen a lot of these cases and and willing to dig deeper for you. Such good advice. Will you tell my listeners where they can find you though, and where they could come see you and learn more info from you? Yes, of course. So, um, I'm very active on Instagram. I'm always doing like live trainings and I do weekly Q and A's where I answer questions from my community and all of that stuff. So, um, please go ahead and, and connect with me there. We'll make sure that you've got my handle. It's just Hannah Aylward HHC. My last name's a little bit of a doozy, so <laughs> we'll, we'll get that to you. <laughs> um, and yeah, come on over, say hi, like, don't be a stranger. I'm very connected with my community and it's, I do this work because like I needed this work. So I feel pretty passionately about it. Um, and what's cool is everyone on our, on my team has struggled with their own issues as well. And I just think that's really important when you're working with someone, like someone that can empathize, they get it. Like I get what it feels like to have to pack multiple outfits when you travel. Cause you're like, am I going to be bloated or am I not? Can I wear the dress or can I not? Like I've lived that experience. Um, but once again, very present on Instagram. And then my website as well is Hannah Um, and you can send us an email through there. Like you can book a call with me. We're, we're really here to help you and, and would love to help you move through your chronic digestive issues or or, um, you know, refer you to the the better person to help you. And do you only see patients virtually or I mean, people virtually or can they come to you? We're entirely virtual. Yeah. And I know you have some free resources for people as well, correct? Yes. So I developed a um, kind of gut health root cause assessment quiz for people to take. Now it's not diagnostic, obviously, right? We're not doing any testing, but it's a great way for you to start to understand what could be at the bottom of these chronic digestive issues that you're experiencing. Um, and you'll get a PDF with like next steps and deeper education that I developed to go alongside your quiz answers as well. So um, we'll make sure that you get that link. It's totally free and you can do it to really dig deeper into um, understanding what your root causes are. Oh, awesome. We will put that um, link in our show notes for everybody that's listening. Thank you so much for being here today and explaining all of this. And I know you, um, a lot of people have related like, yep, that's me. You just described me. And so I know lots of people will want to start getting on a journey, start healing their gut. But as we wrap up, if someone is on their gut healing journey or just starting their gut healing journey, what is something you would want to tell them? Mm. My biggest thing would be you're not broken. And I know that you might feel that way. I felt that way for a long time. Um, but there's so much that can be done. And if you've been told all my labs look normal, I'm, you're just stressed. It's just your anxiety. Please know that you probably just didn't get the care that you really need. And there's deeper dig digging to be done truly. Um, so your body's not broken. It's honestly always trying to work with you. We just have to d get in there, see what's going on and, and really, you know, listen to your body as well. Um, but there's, don't lose hope. I know it gets very painful and like the light at the end of the tunnel gets very hard to see sometimes. Um, but don't lose hope. There's so much that can be done. Oh, I love that so much. Well, thank you again for being here. I always close my podcast episodes by asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? Oh my gosh. Um, nervous system regulation. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Can you regulate your nervous system? The more you can regulate, the better you can handle everything. It's a, it's a deep lifelong lesson for me. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, okay. Since you just brought that up, let's just ask you, what's your favorite way to regulate your nervous system? Yes. Um, breath work, probably. I love breath work. It's so simple. You can learn a few exercises. You can bust them out like whenever you need to. I'll do breath work while I'm like making eggs. I'll do breath work while I'm in the shower, washing my hair. I'll do it while I'm driving in my car. It's free. All you have to learn is like a few different exercises and you can do it essentially wherever, whenever. Um, and just five minutes will actually make a difference in how you're feeling. So that's my, my personal go-to changes the game for me. 
Oh, I love that. I love that you can do it anywhere, like you said. And I always tell people, like, if it's even too overwhelming to go find practices, just do a big, you know, slow inhale and a slow exhale to begin with, because that that will help as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the last thing I'll say is if you can inhale and then you take one more sip at the top and then you exhale deeply, I'm pretty sure Andrew Huberman <laughs> said that's the best way, right? The like, um, it, it's called something like a, a, he has some term for it, but that I think is like the key. It really helps you drop into parasympathetic. So I, I teach that to my clients because that also only takes, you know, you can do that for three minutes and, and notice a difference. Right. Oh, mm-hmm. I love that last little bit of advice. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you for everything you've taught my listeners and I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. It was an honor.